Well, as Dan and uh, Sandy said, I, I want to also welcome you. I think this is a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about the brain, to understand it, see how it works, and most importantly, to see the potential of it. And that's really what we're going to do over the next two days. We're going to talk a lot about brain health. So maybe it's useful on the front end to kind of define it and talk about brain health. Could we run the video? What is the first thing that pops into your mind when you hear the term brain health? Do you think of your IQ? Do you worry about Alzheimer's? Three decades of cognitive neuroscience tell us that brain health is about far more than we had previously ever thought, and that our brains are constantly changing during our whole lives. In fact, no human system has more potential to be strengthened and rewired than the human brain. So, from this moment on, when you hear the term brain health, let's define it as making the most of your capacity to thrive. There are multiple paths to improving our brain health and wellness. Research points to clarity, connectedness, and emotional balance. Clarity reflects your ability to think deeply and strategically, and to create new opportunities and solutions. Connectedness is your capacity to enjoy fulfilling experiences and maintain meaningful relationships. Emotional balance is how you face difficult situations and handle adversity while remaining productive and capable. All these areas are connected, and taken together, they can provide a snapshot of your brain's health and wellness. So, start your brain health journey today and see how far you can go. Terrific. Well, this first session, what we really want to do is build on that. Talk about brain health the research that's going into it, and especially talk about some of the amazing breakthrough work that's being done here at the Center for Brain Health. Now, I'll tell you, it's a little bit intimidating being up here with three women so accomplished as them. I almost feel like the world's a tuxedo and I'm a pair of brown shoes. <laughs> I think the best way to start it, and Jennifer, Jennifer Zients, let me introduce you first of all. Jennifer is the program director here and is involved as the Director of Programs and Client Services at the Center for Brain Health. Um, she is involved in a number of the workshops uh, here that have a variety of audiences, from first responders to those that have served our country to corporate executives. Um, in addition to that, um, she has been very much involved early on in her career in language processing and how that impacts both the treatment and diagnosis of dementia and other type of brain issues. Jennifer, to start us out, could you give us a sense of the Center for Brain Health, 25 years old this year, how it's evolved and the work that's being done here today? Absolutely. And I don't know if I'm on. I don't know how to turn this on. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, well, first of all, welcome everybody. I've got to say, um, I love this question because I was born at the Center for Brain Health, I think. Um, I have been here longer than the center has been stood up. And so I have gotten to work with Sandy and seen an evolution in people and the way that they think about their brain. And I will say that Center for Brain Health is really uniquely positioned to be discovering, researching, discovering, and implementing strategies that will help to strengthen everyday brain health and performance regardless of what may be going on. So I think very uniquely, we are focused on left of boom, this whole idea of how do we start to build a resilience of our cognitive systems and our brain health before something happens to us, but also if and when something does happen, how do we rebound? How do we build our frontal networks in a way that helps us to rebound as fast and as more complete as we can? And so it is, um, it's really cool to see that, you know, if I may, just 25 years ago, people were coming here because they were concerned about differential diagnosis. That's what people thought of with their brain, was differential diagnosis, something has happened, uh, something's happened. Now, I am so excited to say probably 95% of the people that I get to work with are healthy individuals. And so the way that individuals and kind of population has embraced a proactive approach is really what the center is uniquely positioned to do. And Jennifer, that's what's different. I mean, there, there's no shortage of brain institutes all across the country. Most of those, though, probably all of them, to be truthful, 
are really focusing on disease, kind of getting back to a normative position. But you're really focused on not that normative position, but how we can strengthen the brain and actually improve it from the point that we're at today. Exactly. And, and does anyone in here like to be told they're average? <laughs> right? So the idea is how do we make ourselves me but better every single year? How do, me but better, you but better, you but better. So that is regardless of what's going on. I, I used to say to people, I don't really care what's happened to you. Of course I do. But the idea of when I meet you, you're at a point A. And so whatever's happened before, how do we keep helping you to get to point B, to C, to D? And so, yes, in health, I've, from my own experience, we can do more to impact brain health in health. And let's, let's get going. Let's get, let's get it. Unique position, proactive, left of boom. Yes. Terrific. Uh, Kana Enomoto. Kana is a uh, partner at McKinsey & Company. McKinsey & Company is probably the most prestigious international strategic consulting firm. At there, she is director of brain health as part of the McKinsey Health Institute. Uh, has done a lot of work from a research standpoint in terms of substance abuse and mental illness. Works with a variety of clients, from governments, to private entities uh, across, across the, the, the world. Um, prior to McKinsey, she was the acting administrator of the US Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and also as a senior advisor with the US uh, Surgeon General. Um, McKinsey, uh, full disclosure, as an old partner of McKinsey, the Mental Health Institute, or the, the Health Institute, is a, seems like, at least on the surface, is a very different realm for McKinsey to, to be in. But as I just said, you work with a variety of clients. Give us a sense of why that's important to McKinsey, what you're trying to accomplish, and how it fits in with working with clients. Sure. Um, so I'm from the McKinsey Health Institute. And um, unlike Jennifer, I wasn't born there. <laughs> but I feel like I gave birth to it. <laughs> so maybe 25 years from now, someone else will say they were born there. I was actually born in the government, if that's where we're going, which, uh, what does that mean? What does that say about me, I wonder? Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'll pay you $5 later. <laughs> um, but, but no, seriously, I, you know, McKinsey Health Institute was born when our, our now global managing partner, Bob Sternfels, became uh, the head of the firm and said and recognized that the firm needed to make a commitment to not only, you know, a healthier planet, but a healthier humanity, um, or also healthier life, I think. I like the life-centered design. Um, and recognizing that our clients wouldn't continue to exist if we didn't have health on our planet, uh, whether that was with people or, or with sustainability. And so McKinsey Health Institute is, uh, was founded in 2022 on the bold conviction that we could add uh, 45 billion years of healthier quality of life. Uh, across humanity, which averages about six, six years per person. And that means in some places extending life, where we have shorter life expectancy, but in most places increasing quality of life. Uh, because we know that, that, you know, and brain health is a big driver of why we don't have higher quality of life. You know, we've reduced uh, many things, uh, not as much as we should have, but we've reduced many things like infectious diseases, infant mortality, we're making good progress. Uh, but when it comes to the brain, uh, we're far behind. And so uh, I'm the director of brain health because it's a major pillar of what we do and of what we see as, as a holistic approach or a modern definition of health and how we're gonna create this, um, this added uh, productivity and quality of life across humanity. So longevity, quality of life, 45 billion, that's a big number. You talk a lot about extend, lift, extend, and square. What does that really mean? So if you look at uh, life expectancy over time, so from in the 1800s, the average global life expectancy was 30 years old. So most of us wouldn't be here anymore. Um, and even in 1960, average life expectancy globally was 54. So from 1960 to 2019, we extended life expectancy globally to about 73, 74. Uh, but with that 20 years of added life, 
we actually see the same proportion of life spent in poor health. So about one in eight years is spent in poor health, uh, and then the three in eight years is spent in, spent in suboptimal health, so with chronic disease uh, and, and other types of burdens. And so we're still spending, even though we've made life longer, we're still spending half of it in, in less than good health. And so economically, humanistically, Right, like this is this is a, an opportunity for us to build back because it's not a sustainable trajectory to have increasing numbers of people with with the same amount of poor health. Mm. Um, we won't be able to sustain ourselves. Yeah, same person. That, that's both tragic and I think d disappointing too. And a big piece of that, then, Kana, is the element of brain health too. Yeah, absolutely. Now, now for. Full disclosure: Most of I, I'm not actually a researcher. I am a <laughs> I'm an advocate and a policymaker mostly. But um, you know, the work that we've done looks uh, largely at, at on the on the brain um, ill health side, right? So we've done a lot of work looking at what is the global burden of these diseases, and if you look at brain health conditions, so mental disorders, substance use disorders, dementias, etc., um, it's actually more disability burden than all the cancers combined. And you think about how much investment goes into cancer research, cancer treatment, the willingness to pay, you know, if you think about investors or consumers. So I'm excited to hear that the Center for Brain Health is getting a lot of people who are excited to, to, to um, improve brain performance and to, and to boost their cognitive um, performance. However, in society writ large, we're really not seeing that. And so what we're trying to do at McKinsey Health Institute is raise awareness of policymakers, of employers, of large businesses, of leaders around the world to understand that this is a cost that we must address and that we can address. Because up to half of the burden currently caused by mental and substance use disorders and even dementias as well could be prevented, treated, or ameliorated. Right, so, so that we are, most governments are spending less than 2% of their uh, health budgets on brain health. Even though it's a leading cause of, of, of burden, um, it's way, way underinvested. Uh, well, why don't you give us a perspective where the U.S. falls on the continuum of all countries in that regard? Um, so, we, well, actually, even in the U.S., we still only spend uh, about, about 2% or 1% of our healthcare budget. And we're actually on the low end. Yes, yes, we are on the low end. And then even within that, we spend, uh, comparable to other countries, very little on prevention, um, very little on promotion. And so we know that, you know, when you look at populations, half of all mental disorders appear uh, by the age of 14 and three quarters by the age of 24. So if we're thinking about dementias, if we're thinking about chronic disease, like we're way too late. Uh, and that we could actually uh, save our societies and ourselves, our families, um, so much with pain and suffering as well as preserve capacity. And my friend Harris Iyer talks about brain capital. We could be preserving our brain capital if we're paying attention to these things you know, in the, in the early years, right, the first three years of life, prenatally, these are incredibly in, in important times for our brain development. Uh, but even if you're looking at, you know, the progression to disorder, we need to look at those risk and protective factors that keep our young people healthy and that then uh, can lead to healthier, healthier behaviors uh, and uh, reduced burden over, over time. Because the onset of chronic disease, the onset of other conditions, um, these early mental health conditions are risk factors for them. L let's focus on that a little bit more because yeah. you think of health in total as mental, social, <laughs> spiritual, and physical. But when you poll the population across the board, what was interesting in some of the research that I saw was it was young people, the Generation Z. Yeah. They really report much higher, almost across the board in all four of those components, more health problems than even baby boomers today. Well, some of that is probably just a developmental bias. Um, no offense to any Gen Zers in the room, but when you've only been alive for 19 years, whatever problems you're experiencing seem much bigger uh, <laughs> than when you've been alive for 60, 65 years. So, uh, 
<laughs> yeah, it's true. So we we, we did a we did um, it, you know a consumer survey. So not not the kind of epidemiological research that some of you may be more familiar with. But we did consumer surveys in 26 countries, 40,000 people, um, and across generations. And it's true. Uh, our our Gen Zers around the world uh, see report poorer health across all four dimensions, right? So uh, physical health, spiritual health, um, social health, and, um, and their mental health. And uh, it, it, what's interesting is, is as people get older, they actually report better health. And you know, so there's actually like one percent, like non-significant difference between what um, our baby boomers and our Gen Zers reported in terms of their physical health, and it's it's just not possible, right? That people over the age of 60 have the same health as people under the age of 24. Um, but it it speaks to how how people are reporting that. Um, but interestingly, I think what I found most interesting is that even older generations say they prioritize their brain health. That across the board, and especially we did this also, some of these surveys during the pandemic, um, actually McKinsey.com put out a survey and said, which of these four dimensions of health is most important to you? 48% of people said brain health was the most important to them. And this is just a general people who you know, travel across McKinsey.com. Um, it's a, so which surprised me, but you know this is a this is an issue that is of growing salience, um, but we need to convert that salience into action, right? And I, I love what Bruce was talking about in terms of how do we think of the whole system, how do we think in a bigger picture way to turn some of this energy and this awareness into meaningful system change and system design because I don't think we're quite there yet. You know we don't have a way. I mean, I, I'm assuming that people are coming in for enhanced cognitive performance or paying for it themselves, right? This isn't necessarily, you know, in some kind of forward-leaning schools they may be thinking about this, in some forward-leaning universities or employers, but writ large, our society thinks, uh, still thinks that, you know, our brains are our brains are our brains, and, you know, we're stuck with it, there's nothing we can do about it. You know, I have people on a regular, when I go out and speak, people will say, my son says he has depression, is that a real thing? You know, is that, is that treatable? Um, but, but your research would yeah. indicate that most mental issues, mental illness issues, really start young. And then the cost becomes significant, but also affecting longevity in a real sense, too. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think the, the data are pretty clear that people with high rates of trauma, people with mental disorders, people with substance use disorders have much shorter life expectancy. So in some research, it's you know, between seven years to 25 years shorter life expectancy. So real cost on that, real cost as we see increasing incidence of dementia, Alzheimer's, those sorts of things. Major societal costs. So let me drill down a little bit more on a comment. So what do we do from a structural standpoint, delivery systems, what are the big drivers out there that can make a difference? Yeah, I think, you know, first of all, it's important for people to be aware that there is something we can do, right? Most mental health conditions, most substance use disorders, um, there, there are even, even um, cognitive disorders. There are things we can do. Not everything is curable. That's true. We're still sort of on the... I don't think we have silver bullets. However, we have such a panoply uh, of... of of evidence-based interventions, preventive interventions, ways to reduce risk, that you know, even if you took the state of Texas, you know, there's about two million disability-adjusted life years uh, related to mental and substance use disorders in Texas alone. But if we could scale evidence-based practices to everyone who needed them, if we could do promotion at scale, prevention at scale, we could reduce that burden by half. Terrific. Okay. That, that's a good, good point to, to pivot. Now, I want to come over. Jennifer, as you were talking about, Center for Brain Health kind of is focused more on the health and the improvement of it. Um, Julie Franatoni, Franatoni uh, is a neuroscientist. She leads a lot of content development for the Brain Health Project and also is, leads the Kindness Project here at the Center for Brain Health, which is looking at the element and the capacity of kindness in our brains. Fascinating work. Talk a little bit about this Brain Health Project. Just tell us what it is and what you hope to accomplish with it. Sure. Well, who in here is familiar with the Framingham study? Anybody? 
a good few of you. For anyone who's not familiar with the Framingham study, this was a study done in the 1950s um, looking at heart health. And they went door to door with clipboards out of Framingham, Massachusetts, and just asked people about their lifestyle and what they were doing. And this is where we learned um, so much about how to keep our heart healthy and physical health. And this was followed by kind of this big aerobic movement um, in the 70s. And so, um, it's crazy, like at the time, people just thought, they would joke about, like everyone was gonna die of a heart attack. It was like, who was just who was gonna be next? And we've largely surpassed that. Now, nobody really is sitting around fearful of getting a heart attack. Now it's, we're all sitting around fearful of getting dementia or having, you know, different brain decline as we age. So the Brain Health Project is essentially Framingham, but for the brain. We want to understand what are the lifestyle and environmental factors that contribute to keeping a healthy brain healthy. So that's kind of the, the impetus for the project of just really understanding that, doing it at a large scale over, you know, longitudinally. We have set out, um, we said 10 years, but we hope that it'll be longer than 10 years. Um, the Framingham study is actually still going on today, so people are continuing to learn more about that, but really identifying what is it that we can be doing proactively, what does it look like if we intervene younger or at any point throughout the lifespan, and how does that change the trajectory? Or even at this point, because we know the typical trajectory is decline, even to maintain would be a gain. And so what does it look like to, for us to do that? Number of participants, cross section in terms of gender, ethnicity, et cetera, those things? Yeah, so we have currently over 30,000 people have registered. Our goal is 120,000 across 10 years. Um, this may or may not be surprising, but 65-year-old women, women in their 60s, are the biggest percentage of participants. They are really the information gatherers for their families. They're out there, they're curious, they've experienced you know, maybe caregiving for a parent. They're wanting to really get active and bring that information to the rest of their family, but um, they're excited. So really our goals for the project are to expand that. We, of course, want a, you know, an even distribution we want to, and really younger. We really want to see what does it look like as, you know, the things we mentioned earlier that Kana was saying, the data on things develop younger and intervening sooner is helpful to prevent that burden later on. So we really want people in their 20s to understand that the brain does peak in its 20s and you've, that's, you know, intervention, it's never too early to start. Um, and we also want more males. So just <laughs> wanting to even that out because brain health is for everyone. So, so much, much like the framing and study when it focused on cholesterol, et cetera, as impacting the heart. You want to identify markers that not only identify the health issues, but also the type of interventions that take that brain that we thought declined at 20 and actually maintain it and improve it, neuroplasticity. Yes, we are so interested, and we have a paper that just came out actually looking at what are markers of improvement. Currently, everything is very much still in disease model and looking for early detection of disorder. There's really not great markers to know what is an indication of a healthy, thriving brain? How do I know that it's getting healthier and, and, and even better? So that's one thing that we're looking at with the small subset of our imaging study. I should back up and give you a little more context just about the project in general in that it is, um, it's entirely online, so making um, our assessments, our brain health index, our training and coaching all available to, to people everywhere, essentially, really wanting to scale to get, you know, the last 25 years of research that we've done with cognitive training to put that online and, and get that into as many, the hands of as many people as possible so they can use it, um, and then to measure and track that using a brain health index. It's kind of wild that if you were to go to your primary care doctor today and say, give me a brain checkup, like just check on my brain, I just wanna know how it's doing, the same way you would take your blood pressure. They would maybe give you, all, the only tools that they have are a screen for depression or a screen for cognitive impairment. And your brain is so much more than just depression or memory, it does so many other things. And so that's one piece of this project is an, a holistic set of assessments that we put together called the Brain Health Index to give people that snapshot. And not just to take it once and put you in a box or label you, but to say this is just where you are today. Similarly, if you were to just you know weigh yourself or do any other biometric and do that every six months over time um, so that we can really learn from that as well. But it, And also to give people back that information about themselves so they can understand where am I at, what are the things that contribute to my health because largely people are still thinking very much in silos. And so it's helping people understand 
like in the video we showed, you know, it is mental health, emotional well-being is important, but it's also your daily responsibilities, your sense of purpose, your connectedness and social interactions. Um, and then of course the physical elements, sleep, diet, exercise, those foundations. So in terms of aspirations, much like you referenced the framing Ab study and the focus on the heart and what that led to aerobics, physical fitness, et cetera, the aspiration then is to kind of translate that, create a parallel and so we think about a brain movement in the same way we thought about that fitness movement 50 yes. to 70 years ago. Yeah, if you ask people, how do you keep your heart healthy? They know, I, you know, not sedentary lifestyle, moving, you know, smoking, all, how all these things contribute. And we want people to be able to do that, you know, for their brain to know this is what I can do and these are the things I do daily. Okay. I'm going to open it up to questions of the audience, but Julie, you just touched on something that, that, that is fascinating to me. Um, we have focused for so long on hearts. You mentioned cancer research, et cetera, things like that. This is 2024. Why are we really now only starting to focus on the brain? Why is the research so far behind? Jennifer, maybe you comment on that, and kind of like you two, too. Well, I think a lot of it is technology, the advances we've made in technology, and being able through imaging to see what's actually happening in the brain. It would be so lovely if we could do something and you know, be able to see the physical, like you take, you're on a diet and you can see your clothes fit better or you, the scale looks different or whatever, but it's, it's so much different with the brain. And what I, what I see is that also if people will learn, another thing I think is that people always thought, Kana talked about this, that there's nothing that you can do. Now that people are starting to understand more that there are actions that I can take, what we always see is that when people start to take actions, then they start to see their scale or their clothes or, you know, kind of the equivalent of brain performance. And we need to have a lot more awareness. I totally agree that we're lucky that we get to see a lot of healthy people, but I know that's, that's not the norm. And um, at the Center for Brain Health, that would hopefully be the norm. But there's, I, I think that people are now starting to understand. I think there's technology advances and I think there's just a lot more awareness that there are things that can be done and neuroplasticity, that your brain is always changing. Every single day, our brain has this capacity to change, and you're in charge. You drive that, and I think that's one of the biggest things I've seen is an element of empowerment. When people start to understand that, then there's a bigger demand for us to research and understand what's going on and, and, and how we can change things. Tell me your perspective. Why, why is the brain behind? Yeah, I think, I think it is. Um, I think it is important to get the research out there, but I think we also need um, a marriage between uh, storytellers, researchers, policymakers, private sector investors, because at the- All on Bruce. The, exactly, exactly. I mean, that really resonated. Uh, I can see why you said he's a neuroscientist at heart, because um, you know, at, the, at the end of the day, uh, people find the brain scary, right? There is stigma. There is fear. Um, people don't want to mess with something that they don't understand. I think the, you know the advances with AI and our ability to map the brain not within you know a generation but within months and years. I think is is really exciting and helpful. Um, but we will need people that are trusted messengers to share this information. It can't just be scientists. It can't just be the government. It has to be, and it probably won't be insurance companies. Um, <laughs> no offense if there's insurance companies. Uh, in the audience, I have very good friends who are insurers. Um, Former friends. <laughs> um, but but you know, I think I think we need to think about the narrative change, um, about how the you know Patrick Kennedy talks about getting a checkup from the neck up, uh, and the importance of mental health parity. But it's it's also brain health parity, and so we think about people going to get their their DECA scans for their body fat and their visceral fat and all these other you know how fit am I. Um, and, and to create more of a norm around how fit is my brain. Um, but you know, as a person who had nine, a mother and eight aunts who all you know, ended up dying with, with some level of dementia, um, it is scary. It is scary, I don't wanna know. Uh, and that's- Scary on an individual basis, but on a collective societal basis, mm -hmm. enormous cost. Enormous, well, it's cost, but we are not rational economic actors when it comes to stuff that we're scared of. 
right? Like we say like, yes, it's very expensive to have dementia, but I probably won't get it. And so I don't wanna find out if I'm at risk for it. Uh, and, and we think that, I mean, we thought that way about HIV, we think that way about substance use. It's not until something else very drastic happens in society and it gets mandated or some other fear overtakes us mm -hmm. that we act differently. But I think still with, with um, brains and our brain health, um, many people are gonna be avoidant. I think that's one of the exciting things that's coming out of the work here at the center too, is the whole idea that you can improve the brain. Yeah. That it's not simply, you know, we thought we could improve the heart by exercising, et cetera, and clearly that has turned out to be the case. For a long time, we never believed that about the brain. I think just the thought that, as the center of work has done, it's shown that we can improve the brain at any point in life. With that, Julie, then, what are we learning from the Brain Health Project? Granted, relatively early into it, but what are the sort of things that we're learning? Yeah, well, I know one of the sessions later is going to be about our big breakthrough, so I don't want to spoil any of that. Um, you can be the teaser. But, yeah, I think what we're seeing that's really exciting is, one, like Jennifer said, like people that are really eager for this, people want people actually wanting to know about the brain, kind of overcoming and creating a tool in a way that is not intimidating or that helps, you know, so many people are like, oh, I'm like scared to take my brain health index because you're gonna tell me that I'm stupid or I'm gonna fail it. You know, this idea we're so used to these pass fails or like where you fall on a norm. And so trying to get people to understand that this is really, it's you against yourself, right? You are your own baseline and control. Um, so I think helping to create content and, and resources for people to help them kind of shift out of that fear mode into more of an empowerment mode. And we're really seeing that they are able to make gains. So, you know, over a period, um, our first paper that was actually, it was during the pandemic, a really stressful time, over three months, um, engaging in training and coaching and taking their assessments, we saw people were able to make gains on their brain health index. So I think just knowing that when you do give people the options and the resources and the ability, you know, you kind of intervene and support them, um, that that change is really possible and that they, you know, responded well. We also weren't sure, like, will they respond as well online? Because we've typically always done very much in-person training and that, you know, there's just, it's apples to oranges a little bit and we're seeing that that is, um, they're really enjoying the, the access. Real improvement. Um, I don't, I want to leave one thing too. Um, the Center for Brain Health is the leader, but the partners that you have on a worldwide basis are pretty significant. Touch on that if you would. Yes, so we, um, you know, kicked things off here, but I think what makes the Brain Health Project really special is that it is a collaboration across so many universities across the world and really just the top experts that are thinking about the brain in health. Um, I think, you know, to your point earlier about why has there been so much focus on only disease, and I think from a research standpoint, we've learned, we learn from lesion deficit models, we learn from disease models, we've learned all, you know, a lot of what we know about memory from a patient who had both of his temporal lobes removed because of seizures. So there's, you know, it kind of stemmed that way from learning about it, and now we're shifting to this new era of kind of moving forward. Um, sorry, the original, <laughs> I, I went on a tangent. The other partners that we've got. Ah, uh, yes, our collaborators. So anyway, so if you think about who's the researchers that are um, thinking about, there aren't that many. There's maybe 50 in the world, and we've got 30 of them as collaborators on our team. So again, really pushing out of a siloed approach and bringing together expertise because the brain is not just one thing. It is not just memory. It's not just exercise. It's not just nutrition. It's all of it. And so we're really tapping into just the brilliance across the board and using that to make our research study stronger, but also being able to deliver that information to the participants in the training. And recognize bodies like Harvard, Oxford, Stanford. I mean, yes, the most incredible universities think about them, and they're, we're getting to collaborate with them, so it's, it's really special. Terrific. Well, let me open it up to questions if any of you have. Great resources that we have on, on the panel. I think we've got microphones that we'll get to you if you've got a question. Um, I also want to mention uh, we've got two co-leaders of the Brain Health Project, too. Um, Ian Robertson is here, and then Jeff Lang. Jeff, you'll raise your hand. Jeff, Jeff is here, too. <laughs> he's, he's in the back. Both great resources, uh, phenomenal minds. So as you get a chance, I would really urge you to spend some time with both of them, as well as Jennifer and Julie. Questions? Yeah. Uh, hello. Good morning. Please, oh. go ahead. Me? Okay. No, I'll go back to you in just a okay. moment, please. Yeah, yes. Oh, BC? Yeah, BC, go ahead. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. And by the way, this panel is amazing, and I love this kind of emergence that's happening here. And I want to thank you for this. I have a, uh, a, a general purpose question for you all, but I think what I heard here, interesting about longitudinal studies, 25 years of the brain, but also performance. And you know, 25 years ago, McKinsey used to have all of their consultants meditate. 20 minutes, get to theta, that was a competitive edge. And, uh, and that's $1.95 and 20 minutes. And that was really a performance thing. And I remember people were kind of passing around the meditation tapes, kind of like, you know, like weird drugs, like here, I can't tell you that I have it, but use this, you know, to calm the brain down. And I'm curious when you talk about the, the scale of this, I mean, that's something that you could do today. And when you look at corporations, that's the tip of the spear, and you look at university students and so on, to get in front of that. Um, have you guys thought about those $1.95 solutions that you could implement you know, almost immediately uh, to build on the salience, but then make that a norm? I'm just curious. How do you want to start it, but then I want to go over here. It's, it's, a, it's a great thought. I, do, I don't think we do it anymore. I haven't seen the flashcards uh, since I've been there, but I've only been there for five years. Um, I wish we did. Uh, but, you know, I think there has been, I mean, you know, headspace, calm, right? There's been a whole wellness industry pop up since COVID. Um, I mean, it was there before, but it's really taken off since COVID. And so there's been some awareness, but we're also seeing uh, employers and others pull back from that because I'm not sure they necessarily, they felt like they saw the ROI. And I think we need to do more on the narrative to why this is important and why this is something that is valuable and sustainable. And um, I also think we need to start earlier in life and really just build it into our social norms because you know we all know, I mean, we talk about Framingham and heart health and things, like, but people are going crazy, and I don't usually use that word, but people are just really going wild about Ozempic, we go V, right? Like, we want a pill for every pain, we want to make it easy, you know, so for as much as I know that I shouldn't eat this donut or whatever, I want to and I do. Um, so how do, we, how do we make, you know, fostering brain health, promoting brain health, something that is, becomes an everyday automatic action, uh, rather than something that people have to pursue on their own? Jennifer and Julie, both, both of you have dealt with. Can I say with. something to that? Please, absolutely. Thanks. So another thing is we're trying, that's one of our big initiatives, is we're trying to do brain healthy workplace, brain healthy communities, so that we can teach people on a front end, there might be kind of more of a, it might be not 195, but maybe 295, I don't know exactly. <laughs> but number one, we're trying to get people to not have to add something into their day, but to think more strategically, bigger picture, and innovatively in everything that they already do. So instead of adding to, so it shouldn't be a cost. It should be cost benefit because we're doing things better, more efficiently, more strategically, happier, less stress, you know, all sorts of things that we can have. We're also, that's part of what our brainomics venture is trying to do is to get that ROI. Because I agree, at bottom line to business, what is the ROI? And so that's actually um, a lot of the work that we're really trying to do with HKS right now with if I can say it, with Fisher, with um, a lot of different groups that we're really looking at to see what, how does this affect the bottom line? And without having it to be like 10 more minutes of your day, but rather you know, thinking about if you multitask 10 minutes less every day, the cost of multitasking alone because of inefficiencies, errors, low quality, it's, it's big. And that ROI's got two pieces to it, though. It's kind of a two-sided coin. One is the cost from societal standpoint of some of the challenges that you've researched, substance abuse, mental illness, and that. But there's the other side that both of you have worked on with not only some of the group's first responders and people that have protected our country, but with corporate groups that are actually trying to improve the productivity, either individually or collectively of teams. The effect of that? So I think that, I mean, we're try that's what we're trying to get data on right now. And so I think we want to see what's longer term impact of team engagement. Um, we put out a paper last year that was really looking, it, it was in, within a company, but it was really very individual focused. And so now what we're trying to do is really look at group effort. And what happens if an entire, an entire office, an entire team, some kind of unified entity were to work together to help, let's see 
and also, also companies and organizations measure things very differently. Even trying to measure productivity, which is, I think, is everyone's number one thing of like, how does this impact productivity? People measure it very differently. And so that's the other thing that we're really, we want to work and tailor these things to be able to see how are we making an impact on your bottom line, on what your key performance indicators are, on what, you know, what your return on investment would be. Mm -hmm. We had a question a little bit further back. Uh, yeah, my name is George Vredenberg. I'm chairman of the Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative, which is working on this issue globally to take Kana's challenge, which is how do you turn this academic research into action plans around the world? So we advocated for a brain health plan in the United States. We have one. There are now brain health plans in countries around the world. Uh, but the effort here has to be more of a whole of society where academics work together, but you do need business and you do need government. And in the end, the passion that will drive this is patience, is people. So I am curious, just thinking off the top of your head, what are the mechanisms by which we begin to get a much more broad, holistic view of turning what we're learning in neuroscience into both brain health uh, and suppression and prevention of brain disease? Connie, you want to take a shot at it? Um, thank you, George, and great to see you. I, you know, one of the um, things I was going to say also uh, in response to the previous question was, uh, you know, it, 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 it's wondrous to me that I now think this because for 20 years of my life, I never made anybody a dime because I was working for the government and we just gave money away. Um, <laughs> but I came to realize after, after 20 years of doing what I thought was very good work, we hadn't really made a dent in the private sector. And so I, I strongly believe that there are partners that we could enlist in the private sector who will once, if they believe these things, if they can understand the value to them, um, can create some of the shifts that we're trying to see. So thinking about, I don't know if any of you have Microsoft Outlook, but ours sends me this like terrible email, I dread it, because it says, you have zero uninterrupted times during the week, and here's how many emails you sent between midnight and 3 a.m. And, you know, yeah, <laughs> but, but it, it can send this, these analytic data. They have a ton of data on you when you are online, when you're collaborating, when you're on phone calls, who's emailing you. Um, Everybody's running their computer right now. And there, and there are, but there are companies that are using those data to say like, okay, but in, are, we, are we actually optimizing our employees' performance because they're in sort of a toxic workplace, they're, in, they're over, or overburdened, they're inefficient, they're um, not able to get things done in, a, in, in their normal work days. And so I think there's interest there to preserving health and to optimizing cognitive functioning. And I think if the Microsofts and the Amazons and the Googles of the world come on board, I think that will help shift Right, like that will get into everybody's computer, everyone's phone, everywhere. Um, and that, that's where we can see some societal shifts. I, I also think, though, that leadership cannot be underscored, the importance of leadership. We have worked with lots of groups where incredible leaders who will roll up their sleeves, and it's not just for my people, but it's for me too. And that's when we see the greatest impact and adoption and implementation of things. We've also worked with groups where the leaders were not around, and that's extremely difficult because then there's no incentive for teams to implement, and there's so the adherence to things and even accountability and motivation and incentives, they just don't exist. So I think leadership is something that's vital regardless across all sectors. I think leadership is another Julie. important mechanism. Yeah, I would just add that I think there is, you know, acknowledging the hurdle, like, we've been focused so much on becoming proactive because that is what we want to, you know, instill and ignite. Um, but there is the crisis and the numbers and things, you know, that Kana and McKinsey has researched and seeing just what we have to overcome. So, you know, when I'll speak, I usually give people, it's like, here's strategies to, you know, if you can anticipate that a storm is coming or a flood is coming, it's like you put up sandbags, right? You help to like protect. And that's what kind of this proactive thing is. But I feel like most of the time and people in the workplace or it's like, the flood is already there, the water's already coming and you're trying to like, you know, it's an emergent state of emergency. You're trying to um, address that first before you can then, you know, bolster and prepare. So I think it's, 
it's hard, it's like to address, especially in a workplace or in things, it's like there first is the crisis that needs to be addressed and then kind of the proactive building. And that's why sort of starting from needs to be kind of top down and bottom up um, when we're thinking about it coming from all angles. And it's really hard to make those big shifts when it's like there are really big emergency problems. And for, you know, for the average person that's like, I didn't sleep enough, I'm working two jobs, I, you know, I'm financially stressed, I have all this going on, and you want me to meditate for 20 minutes? Like, that's not going to do anything, right? Like, the house is flooded already. So um, I just think we have, we need, we need support on all sides. We've talked today, um, all of you have, about brain research, where it is, the successes that, that we've had, and, and again, thinking about the potential of the brain. So let me close with a question for each one of you. If this was the Brain Summit in 2034, so we're 10 years out, what would you like the message to be on brain research, and what do you think the message will be on brain research? Connie, you want to start? It's a very subtle difference between questions. <laughs> um, you know, what I hope in 2030 we'll be saying, we'll be talking about scaling things that go out to all people, that we'll be talking about um, the, the differences in options that we have versus even just getting to that first option. Um, and I hope that we'll be talking about- So more of a menu that's available to people. Yeah, we'll be, we'll be, I mean, it'll be like a marketplace of ideas. Like, we'll have so many ideas, and there will be so much scale that we'll be talking about, well, how do we identify what are the best ones for which people, and how do we make sure that people, you know, all people have um, access. I think right now we're still getting over the first hurdle of, is there something that people can do? We know that there is, but it's not necessarily accessible to everyone. Um, and and we, we don't necessarily have the differentiated menu of what works for whom and when. Um, so I think that's, that would be my hope in, in the next 16 years we can get to. Great. Julie? So this would be a dream <laughs> for the next 10 years or 10 years from now, and it's only going to be possible if everyone in this room, you know, puts their heads together and takes action from here. But I think for it to be kind of like Connor was saying, I mean, really commonplace of like the way that today people think about a gym membership or meal planning or just these daily things that I do just as maintenance and understanding, you know, sleep's important, um, that they would know what to do for their, their brain and be able to do it, that there's the resources or, you know, taking advantage of the free things and that um, kind of the workplace cultures and things would, would also embrace that and understand that, you know, getting sunlight is important and sitting at, in front of a screen all day is not going to be produce the best work or help you be the most productive. So I think just having a greater, a shift in not only understanding what those things are, but then also just like that it's kind of part of everyday routine. And I feel like 10 years is maybe optimistic for that, but let's do it. <laughs> I, again, I think to both of your points, I, I hope that we're talking more about precision brain health in 10 years from now. And um, so that even knowing incrementally what is it that I can do every day that's going to help me, that's going to help you, 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 each, each and every one of us, that would be really amazing. Terrific. Well, I want to thank Julie, Jennifer, and Kana uh, for a terrific panel. Appreciate it very much. Uh, I hope you've gotten a little bit of feel for the horizon that's out there as we think about brain research, a little bit better understanding of the center and especially what's happening on the Brain Health Project. I personally will tell you that I think it's amazing that we are starting to focus on not only how we address issues with the brain, disease, mental health, and that, but we're actually starting to focus on all of us individually thinking about how we can get more out of our brain. And that is, regardless of our age, regardless of our position, that's what I think is so exciting about what we're doing here in the next two days. Again, thank you for having us. So.